Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for my AP Biology students. What we're gonna be talking about today is how populations evolve. So I encourage you, if you haven't watched my videos before, um, down in the descriptor of the video, you will see a link to the notes that my students use, and that link contains this actual presentation that I'm giving to you right now. I also encourage you to visit my website so you can see the College Board or go to the College Board website, um, and you can see the expectations for this unit, Unit 7, Natural Selection. Um, we're going to work today um, we will be discussing natural selection, but we're going to focus on population genetics and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. This chapter also focuses on continuing evolution, and I'm going to break this chapter into two videos. So population genetics, this is what the College Board expects you to know and understand, which I'll be discussing. I encourage you to pause and read through this and hear a little bit more about Hardy-Weinberg. All right. So the last video, um, set of videos that I did, we talked about the history of evolutionary thought and the evidence for evolution. And this one focus, focuses on how evolution can occur. And so the big thing we need to remember, let me move out of the way so I'm not a bacterium. <laughs> the big thing we need to remember is that evolution is not temporary. It is a heritable change. It's in the DNA. So for instance, a big concern right now is all the bacteria that are getting selected for that are resistant um, to our antibiotics. That's a form of artificial selection. And we're killing off the weak bacteria and they, the ones that are surviving and thriving have the ability to withstand the um, antibiotics that we are applying. So number one, down in your notes, a temporary change um, or changes in an individual's lifetime is not evolution. It must be heritable. And then um, talking a little bit more about populations. Remember, individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. And I gave you that in your notes. And specifically, when you talk about populations evolving, you're talking about changes in allele frequencies. So on your notes, specifically, the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. Now, I encourage you, we will be watching this in my class. If you just Google the five fingers of evolution, that's a great video to watch on the types of things that can change the allele frequencies. And in a nutshell, these are the ones. If you have a small population, and we'll be talking more about this in the video, small populations are more susceptible to things like genetic drift. If you have non-random mating, if mutations occur, if there's gene flow, that means new... Um, new members coming into your population or losing members of your population, or if there are any adaptations, any type of selection, these five things can change your allele frequencies, which would then cause evolution to occur. So um, we need to differentiate between microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is small allele frequency changes, but you're still the same species, still the same species. When you talk about macroevolution, this is when you have new species arise. So on your notes, microevolution is within a population and macroevolution macro is large scale forming a new species. And we'll be talking about that in the next chapter for my students, that's chapter 17. All right, so I wanted to give you an example of microevolution, and this is a yellow-bellied three-toed skink, and normally they would lay eggs, but this one lives in a colder climate, and so it's been keeping its eggs within it and giving a live birth. Now, currently, the ones that maintain the eggs and the ones that release the eggs still interbreed. So this is a form of microevolution. But if ever these yellow-bellied three-toed skinks carrying their embryos stop mating with those that um, don't, then you would have speciation because they're no longer an interbreeding population. And if you're interested in reading the article, you can pause right here and read through this. All right, now 
I want to remind you of something else before we get started on our talk. We know that sperm and eggs are, ha are haploid, right? They contain um, one member of the homologous pair. And in a zygote, right, you restore the homologous pair. Because we are diploid, we have two copies for each allele, right? And so when we talk about things like phenotype, um, that's what an, somebody looks like. So for instance, this individual has blue eyes and this one has brown eyes. Now we know the blue eyed genotype because the only way to get blue eyes is two little beads because that's a recessive trait and actually a mutation. Um, but to get brown eyes, you could have a big B and a little B. That would be brown eyes because brown eyes are dominant over blue or you could have two big Bs, right? Two different genotypes to get the same phenotype. All right. Now, the reason why I bring that up is when we talk about evolution, we're talking about the alleles changing in a population over time. OK, so population genetics is the study of the changes in the genetic makeup of a population changes in their gene pool. And that's down in your notes. Remember, the gene pool is all the alleles in a population, all the alleles in a population. So let's take a look at this situation here. I don't know what these are, maybe wild boars. And big B means bristly hair and little b, little b is smooth hair. I, it doesn't matter, okay? But let's look at their different genotypes, right? This individual right here, I need a pointer, okay? This individual right here is big B, big B, okay? This one is big B, little b. They would still have bristly hairs. To have smooth hair, you would have to be little b, little b. When you talk about populations, you're not talking about individuals mating. Like if these two individuals, this, this is a male and this is a female, your Punnett square is not just between those two individuals, it's all the alleles within that population. So imagine each one of these wild boars throwing in their two alleles right here into the gene pool. And so we wanna count up how many of our gene pool is made out of big B and how many is made of little b in our gene pool. So you could pause me right now and count them up. I will be showing you. Did you count them? Okay. So if you count them up, you can see about half of them. If you look at each of these genotypes, seven of them are the big B, right? You could count up all the big Bs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Five big Bs, five little Bs. Now, in order where we have traits like big B or big C or big S, little S, little W, in when you talk about population genetics, the um, dominant allele is given the designation P and the recessive allele is given the designation Q. All right. So the dominant allele frequency is referring to how many in our gene pool here consist of the big B. Well, seven out of 14. So the frequency of the dominant allele is 50% and the frequency of the recessive allele is 50%. So these two equations um, kind of direct how we analyze mathematically changes in allele frequencies. So right here, the first one is this is your gene pool, P plus Q equals one. And then this is what can come out of your gene pool, the genotypic frequencies of the members of your population. So the way I state it is, here, let me get you right here. So if this is what you have in the gene pool, then this is how it'll play out in your population. So imagine if I reach in the gene pool, I have a 50% chance um, of getting a, um, a P. And if I reach in, I have another 50% chance of getting a P. So P squared would be those two alleles together, 0.5 times 0.5. That means I have a 25% chance of getting homozygous dominant. Remember, that's your product rule, right? Okay, so let me show you again here. Okay, so you could, you could predict using this equation and knowing the frequency of P and Q, what you would predict in your population. So for instance, P squared, right, would be 0.5 times 0.5, that's 25%, right? Product rule, we talked about this in genetics. Getting a heterozygote, you have 50% because it could be you pull out a P and then a Q or you pull out a Q and then a P, right? So it could be either way, so you need to add those up, so that's why it's 2PQ, 50% chance of getting a heterozygote and 25% of getting a homozygous recessive. So you can start with the allele frequencies and predict your population 
or you can analyze your population and then tell the allele frequencies. You can work between these two equations. So here, okay, if you were given an allele frequency, either P or Q, you could predict the percentage of all your genotypes. So for instance, if P equals 0.6, Okay, so you know the frequency in your gene pool of P is 0.6, then what does Q have to be? It's whatever's left out of 100%, right? So Q would have to be 0.4. From that equation, then we can predict what the population looks like, right? Because here in our gene pool, if P equals 0.6, Q equals 0.4. So if you randomly then with your Punnett square of your population, right, then what are the odds that you would get a homozygous dominant trait, which would be P squared, a heterozygous, you would be two PQs, or a homozygous recessive, Q squared. So we can play that out, right? So the chance of getting a homozygous dominant would be 0.6 times 0.6, P squared, right? So that would be 36% would be homozygous dominant. You could either get a P and a Q or a Q and a P, right? So we, we had multiply that by two, 48% you would predict to be heterozygote, and then 16% would be homozygous recessive. Now I wanna point something out to you. Both P squareds and two PQs are gonna show you the dominant trait, right? Both of these would be the dominant trait. You only know right here the recessive trait is Q squared. So conversely, if you know pop, if in your population, 16% of your population is expressing the recessive trait, right? That would be your Q squared. Then you take the square root of that and you know Q. And once you know Q, you know P, and then you could predict how many are homozygous dominant and how many are heterozygous. Why am I teaching you all this? Let me cut to the chase. If these allele frequencies ever change, if P instead of 0.6 becomes 0.7, allele frequencies change and evolution has occurred. That's the defini definition of evolution is if these allele frequencies change. So you analyze allele frequencies to see if evolution has occurred. Okay, so let me give you another opportunity at this. Um, before I do, and you can start, you can pause here if you want to, but let's look at your notes real quick, okay? So my, um, if you look at microevolution in the peppered moth, I will show you that peppered moth in just a minute. I gave you population genetics. Number two on allele frequencies, the gene pools all the alleles in the population. Now, if you're not taking notes, try doing this problem right here. Okay, so gene pool is all the alleles in a population. I gave you everything for B and I gave you everything for C. If you read through that, genotypes are as a result of the allele frequencies. Genotypes are as a result of the allele frequencies. So PP or P squared would be homozygous dominant. PQ would be the heterozygotes. And QQ or Q squared is the homozygous recessive. Okay, if the allele frequencies for a particular trait remain unchanged, P and Q values remain the same generation after generation, then that, then that trait is not changing or evolving and is said to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then I gave you the rest of the equations there. Okay, let's now let's address this. The tall trait in a P plant is dominant. We know that, we've done a bunch of Mendel on that, right, in P plants. In a field of P plants, 36% are tall. Could you tell me what in the gene pool that created that population, what is the frequency of the tall allele? What is the frequency of the short allele? And then in that population, how many of them would you expect to be carriers of the short allele? Now, the first thing I would do is I would remind you that tall would be the P squared plus the two PQs would be tall, right? So, the only ones that are going to be short are going to be the Q squareds. They are telling you in a field of P plants, 36% are tall. That's referring to your P squareds plus two PQs, right? So remember, if your P squareds plus two PQs are 36%, 100 minus 36 is 64. That means 64% in your population are the recessive trait, which is Q squared. How could you solve then for P and Q, okay? Well, if Q squared equals 0.64, all you need to do is take the square root of that, right? So Q squared equals 0.64, therefore Q equals 0.8. 
Once you know Q is point A, remember P plus Q equals one, then P must be point two. That is the frequency of the tall allele. And if you go back to my original question is, besides those two allele frequencies in the gene pool, I wanted you to tell me how many of them, if 36% are tall, how many of them are um, heterozygotes? Um, and so that would be your two PQs, right? So two times 0.2 times 0.8 is 32%, okay? So remember, 36% total were tall, but now we can predict that only 4% were homozygous tall, right? Because 36 minus 32%. Okay, so that on your notes, you have all those equations down there on those notes. So let's look at this if we put it in a Punnett square, right? So in our population, if 0.6 care in our in our gene pool, right, we have 0.6 are the dominant trait and 0.4 is the recessive trait, then can you see right here this combination? This would be big L, big L. This would be our P squared, right? This would be a PQ, a PQ, right? So that's why we say two PQ. And then this right here is your homozygous recessives, your Q squared. Population genetics studies the change in allele frequencies. If the allele frequency changes, then evolution is occurring. So right now the dominant allele is 0.6. What if the dominant allele becomes 0.7? Then the recessive allele becomes 0.3, right? So we could work that out, right? So take a look at this. That means now 49% show the dominant um, being homozygous dominant, and 42% would be heterozygous, and now 9% are homozygous recessive. Allele frequencies change, so evolution is occurring. So here's another one for you. My students will be doing it in class. You might want to pause just for a minute. I will give you the answer. You ready? Here's your answer. Okay, it's right here. And at the end of this presentation, I put in a bunch of practice Hardy Weinberg problems and showed you how to solve them. So just go to the descriptor of the video and um, download the notes and click on the link to this presentation and you can have more practice problems if you would like it. So let me talk to you about the Hardy Weinberg law. This is what we're leading up to. If you can prevent allele frequencies um, from changing, then you can prevent evolution. And really what the Hardy-Weinberg law or principle is doing is it's a backdoor way to show you, you can't prevent them. There's too many things that can change allele frequency, those five that I mentioned earlier. And if therefore, if you can't stop allele frequency, if you can't stop allele frequencies from changing, then you can't stop evolution. Evolution is occurring. All right, so see on your notes, the Hardy-Weinberg principle only applies if the population remains unchanging. To ensure that, five conditions have to be met. So let's look at those five conditions uh, to prevent um, the allele frequencies from changing. The first one is you can't have any mutations, right? So number one is no mutations. Number two, there's no migration, no influx of new alleles, nobody leaves your population, okay? That's the second condition you would have to maintain, no migration. Number three, you would always have to have a large population because small populations are susceptible to genetic drift. That would freeze your allele frequencies. Fourth condition, you have to have absolute random mating. So no one bug is better than another bug. And number five, no selection. Now I like to use this as an example. Look on the back, okay? This looks like a face right here, right? A little bit of a face. Now imagine if you're a predator coming up, you're gonna wanna avoid the face, so you'd probably come around to this other side. And that is where the real face is, and they would probably bite you, and then it would, you know, that's a defense mechanism. Do you think he's ever seen this face here? No. But those snakes that had the cobras with this face on the back were more likely to survive and reproduce. So can we stop selection? Generally, no, right? Because some traits are gonna be adaptive and make you more likely to survive and reproduce and increase your fitness. So these five conditions that we're trying to maintain, right? No selection, no mutation, no migration, always large populations, always random mating, 
These five are really hard to meet. So since we can't meet those five conditions, then evolution is occurring. All right, so you have everything for D. So for letter E in your notes, since it is difficult not to violate these conditions in natural populations, alleles must be changing and therefore evolution must be occurring. Evolution must be occurring. Now, remember when we talked about this industrial melanism, right? So here, pre-industrial revolution, the uh, no soot on the trees, they're light colored. So this moth, right, this would be considered um, an adaptation that increases their fitness because the birds are less likely to see this moth. They're more likely to see this one. So if this is a coloration, right, just like we have brown eyes and blue eyes, you would expect then that the black eyed allele would go down, and or sorry, black colored moths would go down and the light colored moths will go up. Right now, now the environment changes and there is pollution on the trees. So now it's more adaptive to be dark. Okay, this change in allele frequency of what color moth is a form of evolution. What kind of evolution? It is microevolution because they're still the same species. It's just a frequency in what color is adaptive for that environment. Okay, so that's what I mean about microevolution and the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so remember we went through those conditions, those five conditions you have to meet in order to prevent um, allele frequencies from changing. One of those is mutations, just like blue eyes is a mutation. Can we ever stop mutations from happening? No. So that's one condition right off the bat we cannot meet. So a mutation is defined as a change to the DNA sequence, and it can serve as a source of variation. Okay, so um, it could be a mistake, it could be a mutagen, um, and if it is passed on to that offspring, right, then it is in that gene line. And if allele frequencies change due to mutation, then evolution is occurring. All right. Another one is no gene flow. No my. Um, remember, we said no gene flow. It, it can't. No migration out or into a population. So gene flow is the movement of alleles between populations. You would have to prevent that, right? You would have to make them reproductively isolated so there was no gene flow. If gene flow occurs, allele frequencies will change evolution is occurring. I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but what I'm trying to make you sh make sure you understand is Hardy Weinberg sets you up to fail. There's no way you can meet these five conditions, so there's no way you can prevent evolution from occurring. Okay, the third, uh, another condition is, or the third one in this case, is um, that um, small populations can cause changes in allele frequencies. And the reason why is they are more susceptible to genetic drift. Okay, drifting in one direction or another because there's so few of them in that population. They are more susceptible to chance. Chance. So genetic drift is defined as changes in the allele frequencies of a gene pool due to chance events. Smaller gene pools are more impacted by drift. Let's talk about two forms of genetic drift. Okay, so one is called the bottleneck effect. So when you look at this bottle right here, look at all the different colors that are in this bottle and count them up, right? Have you counted them? I see purple, green, yellow, gray, is there another color, and blue, right? So there's five colors. But if we only, if we go through a bottleneck, some sort of crisis and only a few get through, all of a sudden now, instead of five colors, we're just down to three colors, right? So this smaller population that came through this bottleneck, right, is not representative of the original population, okay? They are more susceptible to changes. So let's say you had a population of frogs and you had some brown frogs and you had some green frogs. And let's just say a tree fell and just happened to fall on the brown frogs. It doesn't mean the brown frogs are less adaptive. It was just chance. And since the population was so small, now the brown allele has been eliminated. And so therefore you just see green frogs. So here, the first one, bottleneck effect is a disaster happens, a disaster. So new populations allele frequency does not reflect the original. 
Okay. Another form of genetic drift is what's called the founder's effect. So for instance, Amish fleeing Europe and religious prosecution came here to the United States. So there was a small representation that could fit on that boat that came here to the United States. It just so happened that they had a five finger dwarf amongst them. So that was not it, it represented a larger percentage of the population on that small boat than it did, let's say, in a European colony. So as a result of inter, you know, breeding with the five-fingered dwarf, then you have a larger percentage um, that are displaying that trait. And here, I think I have a picture for you here, five-fingered into it. And that's actually having five fingers is a homozygous, uh, or sorry, is a dominant trait, is a dominant trait. All right, so when you have, let me go back here. So founder effect, a portion of the population starts a new population with a fraction of the total alleles. The new population's allele frequency does not reflect the original. Now, Amish wanting to mate with others that had the same religious beliefs as them, um, this could lead to, and I'm not, uh, um, this could lead to inbreeding. I'm gonna talk about that in just one minute. Let me show you this form of genetic drift as an example, this cartoon. So here, this particular deer is not mated with. They do, there is a form of selection and they don't like, the other females don't like this reddish color, let's say. And he's saying, why doesn't anyone love me? Then there is a forest fire and a lot of the deers are wiped out or gone away. So now all of a sudden he becomes more popular because they're the only two left. This is a form of genetic drift because it was such a, um, a small population that when you wiped out a whole bunch of them, right, then, then all of a sudden he becomes more popular and more likely to be mated with. And like I said, this could, these smaller populations could lead to inbreeding. And this is more likely to have an impact on smaller population. It doesn't necessarily change the allele frequencies, but the combinations that come out of those, the genotypes. So inbreeding, mating with relatives, doesn't affect allele frequencies, but can ultimately affect genotypes and then the phenotypes, which can be selected for or against. All right. Then the next one that could cause changes in allele frequencies is non-random mating. Random mating be whoever will do, right? So non-random mating, she, she is choosing to mate or he is influencing his dominance here um, with this male because he's the biggest and the strongest and she would like her offspring to be large and strong. Remember talking about increasing fitness and your ability to pass on your genes. So non-random mating does not necessarily change allele frequencies, but it does affect how the alleles in the gene pool assort into genotypes, into groupings, right? And um, one um, word term I want you to get down is assortative mating. If you want to mate with somebody that looks like you, right? Um, and this will also be important for initial divergence of gene pools and then maintenance of that species, wanting to mate with somebody just like you. All right. And then the fifth and final one is natural selection. So, and we've talked about natural selection a little bit already, but in video number two, we're going to go into the different types of selection that there are. So for right now, for natural selection, some phenotypes have a reproductive advantage. Their traits will be passed on while others will not. Natural selection is the foundation for Darwin's theory of evolution. Okay, so let's uh, kind of recap where we are on this video, all right? So remember, number one, evolution is a change in allele frequencies, is a change in allele frequencies. And what the Hardy-Weinberg um, principle says, look, if you want to prevent evolution from occurring, you've got to meet these five conditions. Your populations must always be large because small ones are susceptible to genetic drift. You must always have random mating because non-random mating leads to selection. You must always prevent mutations because mutations change allele frequencies. You must always prevent gene flow. No gene flow between two different populations because you might get new allele frequencies and there cannot be any selection. Nobody's better than another. And in conclusion, since it's difficult to meet those five, then you cannot maintain Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and therefore evolution is occurring. All right. Well, if you are one of my students, I'll see you in class.